No? I am on. <laughs> I believe. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, I wanted to read from the scriptures. Colossians 2 says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And that's why we're here this morning, so we can be rooted and built up through gathering together, hearing the word, singing together, praying together, discussing the word afterwards, and just being with one another. So I'm grateful for everyone that did come out, and uh, I'm and we do, don't want people to feel pressure to come out if they feel like it's unsafe. So those that are viewing at home, uh, just next time. <laughs> but I'm glad people don't feel pressure to come out because I'd feel bad if someone got stuck or stranded on their way out and couldn't get help. So, But we got a good turnout this morning. Happy for that. And uh, thankful that we have uh, a God worth gathering for, right? And we gather on the first day of the week because that's when Christ rose from the grave and we have the hope of resurrection and all that that entails as well. Let's be reminded that God is good and all the time. All right, Clint. I guess I'll ask for announcements, but why I guess Wanda's making a way. I'd just throw in a plug for everybody here or not here um, for the men's encounter coming up here in a couple weeks. Uh, it's actually a Thursday evening through a Saturday evening. So anybody interested, let Merle or, or I know or um, JD's been, or some, several people around has been. If you've got any questions, holler. Sue wanted me to announce that Mary Singles will meet Thursday, depending on the weather, at Donna Snyder's house right over here and at 10 o'clock. So come join us for a cup of coffee and make some plans for the new year a couple things first of all shirt orders were going to be due today but i had several people ask that weren't going to be here if we could extend that so i'll actually make it till next sunday so i'll gather those and get those turned in next sunday and also i um, wanted to put my plug in for women's encounter it'll be at the end of the month and i'll be going so if any women are interested in going please let me know and i'll get you signed up And we're still doing our three weeks of intensive prayer. If you haven't received the book, um, we will meet Wednesday at 2.15 at the turquoise table. Um, we didn't meet last Wednesday due to weather, but the first time we kind of got in a vehicle and we did a little prayer drive around the schools. And so if you're interested, um, Wednesday at 2.15. Good morning. Uh, add counsel for tomorrow night. We're going to postpone until February. If there is any urgent business that needs to be done during that time, we will convene uh, via text, or if we need to get together, we sure will. So just due to the weather, let's, uh, we'll meet next month. Thank you. And then starting in February, we're starting a Sunday school class for people interested in becoming members. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, we ask you to join to go through this Sunday school class together, but it's not close as of now. I, I, we're going to try it out this time. It's not closed to people that um, are just curious about membership or people that are want to review the things that we believe as a church. We'll be going through the statement of faith. Um, so, uh, but it could be an opportunity for the people that normally attend my Sunday school class to try some of the others. But you won't have to have to if you want to stick around and and uh, participate in, in the conversation and Bible study around that. So that's starting in February. All righty, how about uh, any birthdays? <laughs> how old are you? In a couple months, all right. That is anticipation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Jerry said there will be a day he won't anticipate that day. But, uh, oh, Grandpa. <laughs> uh, any anniversaries? 
Oh, we got winners back here. 33 years for Don and Donnie. Let's sing. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. I just want to tell everybody that's not here this today, it's really, really weird because there's only six people sitting in the back. And everybody else is sitting in the first six rows. That's pretty impressive for a church to set that close to the front. So, <laughs> huddle together a little bit. All right. Well, let's prepare our hearts and our minds and just open them up to the Holy Spirit this morning. morning and we'll read this together <clears throat> we gather today to worship the one who created us the one who calls us the one who equips us the one who loves us without end with joyful hearts let us worship God now the praise band can come forward we'll warm this place up good morning good morning paper. It's good to see everybody, those of you who are here, those of you who are online, those of you who are willing to brave it, those of you who were smart enough to stay home. I don't know which it is, but uh, it's good to be together in the house of the Lord to worship together. From Psalm 23, 5 and 6, you prepare a place before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Two, one and two. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God.
Dear Lord, we come this morning, Lord, and we come through the cold air, Lord, to a warm place, Lord. We, um, we come into your presence, Lord, and Lord, we pray for the ones that are not here this morning, and Lord, to just bless them and lift them up and that they can feel the warmth of you inside them, Lord. We pray for the ones who, who need to find the warmth of you, Lord. Lord, we just lift up this service and the ones that are here. Lord, we lift up Pastor Brian and his message, Lord. And we just uh, ask that you bless this time. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sarah has the children's moments this morning. Metro or in Thailand. <laughs> Your knees were? Yeah. Oh, what'd you do about it? Well, I want to put my teacher's bag in the room. Uh huh. That's a good idea. Do you have like long johns on under your jeans? No? No? Do you have long johns on? Clint came in the other day and he had two pairs of socks, long johns, two shirts, and you wonder why he was hot in the house. I got long socks too. Do you? Yeah, like with socks and things. Mom, Mommy, I don't want to wear socks and little. Really? Oh, so you were warm, weren't you? Yeah. So have you guys built a snowman this week? It's too cold to build a snowman, isn't it? Mine no, it's not. My, it's not? My eight boots I'm on one. Huh? Did you watch the snowman? Did you? It's kind of cold for snowman. Did Levi? Why'd you do that? I just he was not nice to me and then he built a snowman right at my neck. Well, then you should. Well, there you go. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, he, he didn't show my snowman in first. Uh oh. Sir, so did you rebuild your snowman? No. Well, I'm just kind of listening to you guys as I work. So, you know what, guys? What do you think I'm doing? Cutting paper. I'm cutting paper. Ah, I'm cutting paper. But we don't know what you're making. You don't know what I'm making, though, do you? Mm -mm. This goes back to the old days when I was a little girl. That was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever do this? Have you guys just got paper and just cut paper just to cut paper? No? Hmm. It's kind of fun. Kind of makes you use your imagination some. Are you building a snowflake? You think that's what I'm doing? Yeah. That looks like one. Let's see what I have here. You do, oh, oh, there you go. Is that better? Okay. Snowflake. Why do you think this is? A snowflake. It's a snowflake. I guess. I would have brought in a real one, but I thought it might melt. Gotcha. Well, that's kind of a snowflake, right? You know what? Now, the funny part is, if I would try to make one just hey. like this again, I couldn't do it, could These I? These are the hearts and the because on the tree yeah. and on the Oh, there is hearts. And the tree. Yes. My and goodness. Like um, kind of looks like a tree. Because, you know what? Every snowflake is different. Did you know that? There's not two snowflakes that are exactly alike. All that snow out there, there are not two snowflakes that are exactly alike. I know. I know. So no snowflakes are alike. You, who? What else do you know that's not alike? You know, God made us like snowflakes. Yeah. And also that when we sing... It's a different tone or the same. That's right. You know, God made all of us 
that none of us are the same, hey. just like those snowflakes. And okay, so does one snowflake make a snowman? No, it just makes a drop of snow. Right, if you just had one snowflake out there, would it make a difference? It wouldn't, would you? You wouldn't even know if you saw one, if we just had one snowflake. Think but think about all the snowflakes out there right now and how all of those snowflakes um, are all different. Remember, and, uh, remember it rained last night in the milk, and it melted my, and it melted my, and it melted my fork. Oh, goodness, that's terrible. But um, just like all of those, it took a bunch of snowflakes to make all this snow, didn't it? And like every snowflake is different. Those are kind of like God made us. God made every one of us different. But you know what? If one of us was out there preaching about Jesus Christ in the world, that's important. But you know, if all of us, kind of like all of those snowflakes out there made all that snow, if we all went out and preached about God together, look what a difference we could make. Have you ever heard mighty in numbers? Kind of like snowflakes. One snowflake doesn't make a difference, right? But you get a bunch of snowflakes together, and look what it can happen out there. God made us like snowflakes where every one of us are different. And every one of us has our unique qualities. Just like God made every snowflake different. But if we band together like snowflakes, look at the big things we can do. One snowflake can't make a snowdrift, can it? No, but a bunch of snowflakes can make a, a, a snow drift. Just like a bunch of us, if we're Christians and we go out there and we talk to all of our friends about Jesus Christ and how important Jesus Christ is, wow, guys, we can make a difference, okay? So when you're out there building your snowman today or in your fort or playing in that snow drift and you see all those snowflakes, think about how we're kind of like that. God made us different, just like every snowflake's different. But if we get together with all of our friends and start telling everybody about Jesus Christ, we can make a big drift in the big snowman of the world, okay? So I have a little chore for you. I'm going to give you each some paper. And when you get home tonight, you guys can all make snowflakes. You want to make snowflakes? I don't even know how to make them. You do? Okay, well, I bet I your mom. Oh, you want some? I know. Here, I'll give yours to your brother okay there you go guys take this home make some snowflakes and hang them on your windows here titus here titus hang them on your windows or wherever you want to hang them and just when you look at them just remember that we're snowflakes like god's a snowflake okay let's pray real quick <coughs> dear god we want to thank you for getting us here safely today and for the keeping us safe during this last week with the snow and the cold weather. We know that you're our protector and our provider, and we know that you will get us through this cold front. And Lord, we know that we are each a child of yours, and we are all different, like God made every one of those snowflakes different. Be with us this week, keep us safe and warm, and let us remember to always look to you and thank you for our blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, here guys. We'll now have our uh, opportunity for our worship and giving, our offering, and let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful, Lord, for all that you've given us, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. We just pray that we give with open hearts and, and freely give, Lord, and how, how you enjoy that and how you freely give of yourself to us, Lord. We just thank you and bless this in your name. Amen.
turn our minds towards praying to the Lord with requests that each other has shared. And uh, I just love how on Sundays we sing to God and then we pray to God and we read God's word. We hear from God whenever we read the scriptures. So it's we're interacting with God throughout our Sunday morning and we're doing it together. So I've got a small stack of prayer requests. The first one, Tracy Carroll's daughter, Lana, uh, had her furnace go out. So pray for a swift fix for uh, Lana or Lana. I'm not sure which way. Tracy, Tracy's daughter. Uh, bad time to have the furnace go out. Now we've got a prayer request for uh, Katie and Lucas. Uh, their pipes are frozen, so they're staying with Dawn. And Lucas's car won't start. And it also got stuck and had to be pulled out. So really, we really do need to be praying for them. These are these stressors that just can lead you to get discouraged or become a temptation uh, to sin. And uh, I can relate with this last week with our kids being out of town and stranded. And, and I was just, before I preached last Sunday's sermon, I was talking to someone about studying the Bible as you you read the Bible, you meditate on the Bible, and then God will test you and see if you have learned. <laughs> and that's an important part of learning the Bible. And I felt like, okay, now I'm being tested in what I preached. And uh, so praise the Lord that we have one another. We can pray for Lucas and Katie as they're going through a challenging time and just pray that those issues get resolved and uh, they get back into their routine and don't feel too displaced. And speaking of feeling displaced, be praying for Norm Claussen. He, he is residing at Peabody Rehab. So pray for peace and comfort uh, with him. He's, Judy's just been having an increasingly difficult time uh, taking care of him. And she told me last week that she needs to be his wife and not his nurse. And so be praying for Norm and Judy. And also pray for Judy's daughter, Jody whose surgery is Tuesday. Uh, we have a prayer request for Rod and Lynn's granddaughter. Uh, how do you say her? Brielle. Brielle, okay. I thought that, but then I last minute, maybe it's something else. Brielle, <clears throat> she has RSV. Pray for her and that Erica and her husband Cody don't catch it. And then, uh, so pray for Brielle with RSV and her family, and pray, praise that Evan is home and doing well. And uh, we also want to pray for Neva and Lyndon uh, as they mourn the loss of their son, Travis. And so we'll be keep, continue to be praying for them throughout this week as they have a difficult week ahead. And... Her father passed away? No, she was in the hospital. Okay, I missed that one. Becky Peterson's dad, father, is in, uh, in hospice. That's true. We do need to also praise God for the answered prayers that Isaac and Allie and Emma made it to Ohio. There was a lot of people praying for us and for them, and the Lord did answer those prayers. Okay. So now that we have these brought to our attention, let's go ahead and take these before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we have some very heavy and very uh, troubling prayer, prayer requests that we want to bring to you this morning. And we have... Uh, joys that we want to share and thank you that you have given to us and we have uh, just uh, less heavy but still important and and uh, tri troubling things that we want to bring before you lord and so we pray for all of these to the one who cares about each one of us and each thing on our hearts and we're obeying you by bringing these to you we pray for tracy's daughter uh, that her furnace will get uh, fixed quickly in this terrible weather 
and pray that uh, she won't have any difficulty in getting that accomplished and paid for. We pray for the Zerkers. Uh, just with all these trials that are piling up, I pray that it wouldn't, wouldn't be a source of temptation. Uh, I pray that it wouldn't be a source of uh, frustration, but they will turn these, these frustrations over to you and trust that you will do what's best. We pray that you would resolve each of the issues with their car and their house and pray that uh, they'll just get back to normal quickly, Lord. Father, we pray for Norm, and I pray that you would give him a peace that is beyond understanding, uh, that could only come from you. We pray that you would comfort him as well through this change that he's going through. Father, I pray that uh, you would uh, strengthen his heart. I pray that you would give him and Judy unity and just increase their love for one another, that they might... Uh, have that peace and, and blessing as well. We pray for Jody uh, that her surgery will go well and be successful and lead to the healing of her body. Father, we also pray for uh, Brielle. Pray that she will recover from the virus that she has. We pray that her mom and dad won't get it either. Uh, we pray that it won't grow into anything serious but be resolved quickly and she'll be restored to health by your hand and by your power we thank you that evan is home and he's doing well we thank you for answering our prayers regarding my kids who are traveling thank you that they got got to school safely and there was no danger for them as they went through all those problems thank you for your hand of providence in each step of that lord we pray for uh, becky peterson and her family is her her father is in hospice, Lord. We pray that you would give her a comfort and a and a, an awareness of your presence in her life as she's going through this uh, journey. And we pray for Neva and Lyndon as well, Lord. We pray that they would feel uh, your presence nearby. That they would they would feel the presence of Jesus Christ, and to know that even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They will fear no, no harm and no evil, Lord, knowing that you are with them. Pray that you will prevail in their lives and just give them a peace that we cannot understand. We pray that they might see you and feel comfort. Pray for all of uh, Travis's family, Lord, and that you would comfort them. Lord, I I pray that you would remind all of us here to continue to be praying for one another throughout the week, that we might be taking full advantage of the, the blessing to have you as one who answers prayers and listens to us. I pray that you'll be with those who are struggling to pray, that you would uh, help them to just get over that hurdle and spend time praying to you, that they might reap the blessings and feel the benefits of spending time with you. Father, we join together as an assembly here, lifting our hearts in prayer to you, uh, praying the prayer that Jesus gave to teach us how to pray. So we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand together as Clint reads God's word for us? This is Mark 14, 32 through 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here a while while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to great, be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, 
all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So last week we looked at a prayer of David. And this week we're going to be looking at this prayer of Jesus that he prayed in the garden uh, as he was facing a, an unimaginably difficult time. Uh, incomprehensible, really. But I've really been looking forward to preaching this sermon. I feel like the Lord really uh, gave this word to me as I studied this. And, and really, I'm excited about this series and, and uh, preaching on specific prayers and just spending one sermon on each one. And I think this is a really important uh, concept to grapple with and to understand this prayer that Jesus prayed. So if you'll uh, turn your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 14, we're going to be looking at those verses that Clint read, and really I want us to be thinking about this idea that Jesus began praying, uh, let this pass from me, let this not happen, but then he did pray, but not what I want, but what you want, and then he rose up and he went and he faced it, and that's just an amazing thing that Jesus experienced that. Uh, but certainly, we can experience that as well. And I want us to think about what, um, where Jesus' mind was leading up to this prayer. What led him to pray this prayer? So if we think about it, uh, if, you, if you look up at verse 27 and 28, it's, uh, Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So he knew, he, this isn't just the only passage, there's other passages where Jesus was be preparing his disciples saying, I am going to die. And so Jesus knew he was going to die, and that's what led to this, this prayer. He knew his death was imminent. He knew that there was a plot to kill him, and the, this plot involved the abuse of power. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had authority in the community, and they had pull with the Roman government, and they were abusing their power to successfully scheme against Jesus. Just try to imagine if you were in Jesus' shoes, and the people, the religious authorities were scheming to harm you out of jealousy, and this plot was illegal. He, he could make a legal claim saying, hey, something's going down that shouldn't be happening here. And uh, their motive to do this was completely unjust. They were jealous. They felt that he was pulling attention and power away from them. They felt their, their power over the people slipping away. They weren't looking good in front of people. This was part of their motives to kill him. Uh, Jesus, think about this, Jesus was intellectually superior to them, right? How many times did he thwart them in an argument, right? And they had to walk away. Uh, they couldn't beat him in an argument. Socially, Jesus was accepted and loved, and the crowds came to him, and they loved him, while the crowds feared the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Legally, Jesus was innocent, and spiritually, Jesus was pure, and he's got these religious leaders, uh, these hypocrites, conspiring to murder Jesus. And they conspired with their political enemies. They conspired with Rome. 
if they could get rid of Rome, they would have done it. There was, there was a, a, there were rebellions going on at that time. There was a major rebellion in the generation before theirs, which led to them having the power they did have. But they conspired with their enemy Rome. They conspired with their social enemies. The Pharisees and the Sadducees did not get along with each other. The power struggle was between them as well. Some were in charge, the Sadducees were in charge of the temple, and they could give rules, and uh, they were kind of a ruling class. Previously, they, became, they had uh, like princes and rulers, and they would still retain some of that as the high priest, those involved in the temple, the priest could make rules. And then he had the Pharisees who were in charge of the, the uh, synagogues where people would gather and read God's word. And they had social ability over people where they could kick people out of the synagogue and say, you're an outsider now. You're an outsider of our society. So they both had power in different regions and they didn't get along except when it came to murdering Jesus. Then they conspired together. And they conspired against Jesus through one of his trusted friends. Jesus knew that Judas was betraying him. When he made this prayer, he knew it had been done. At the, Lord, at the Last Supper, he said, go do what you have to do. He, told, he dismissed him. But to be betrayed by a close friend hurts. To be, betrayal hurts. That's what Jesus was facing. Consider this. Jesus knew that God, his Father, could prevent what was happening. He was able to prevent it, but he chose not to. That was on his mind. And that's something we have to face sometimes as well. Why did God let this happen? If you'll turn with me to uh, just glance over to Acts chapter 4. In verse 28. This is another thing that Jesus knew about that. Not only was God, his father, allowing this to happen. In Acts 4.28, it talks about uh, Jesus' crucifixion and uh, that, it was, that this event was whatever God's hand and his plan predestined to take place. Jesus knew that God's hand, not only was God allowing it, but that God's hand predestined this to take place. So he knew that his enemies were against him in, in an unjust way. His friend was betraying him. God could have prevented it, but he didn't. And he also knew that God's, it was God's plan for it to happen. Furthermore, he knew that God's wrath was going to fall down on him. It wasn't only going to be his enemies murdering him with their hands, but God's wrath was going to fall down on him. Jesus knew the plan. Uh, Jesus was not in the dark about this whole reason to become a human being. The wrath of God that was aimed at sinners who had rebelled against God was going to be turned away from them and poured squarely on Jesus Christ, who was never unfaithful to his Father. And Jesus was going to feel all of the, the guilt and the shame of all the sins of the world that were placed on him. He felt all of that, and all of this was weighing on him. He was going to be murdered at the hands that he created for sins that he never committed. And so that's what leads to this event that we read about here. And uh, so we read, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I pray. So here we read that Jesus went to a location uh, to pray. We talked about that last week. But he chose this location. He brought his friends with him. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. So he took all of his disciples from the Last Supper, went to the garden, the Olive Garden, uh, this olive orchard on the Mount of Olives, and then he took these three with him further on for this personal moment. And then he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And so think about this. Uh, he knew all this was coming, so he went to pray. He, he, all that was weighing on him, so he went to pray. And then once he committed himself to prayer, he went to the location. He brought his friends. 
Then he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And just think about that. Well, you set out to pray sometimes, and then the distress sits in. Then the troubling, as we're, we have to face it mentally, uh, what we're dealing with, we begin to feel the distress and the trouble. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. So Jesus was, this shows us how Jesus was feeling. He felt so sorrowful, he felt like he could die. He felt like he couldn't, he, he just couldn't take it. It was so heavy on him. And we know in, uh, well, let's turn over to, to Hebrews chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, look at Hebrews chapter 5. This description of what he's going through, this uh, sorrowful even unto death. Hebrews chapter 5, in verse 7, it says, In the days of Jesus' flesh, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his, because of his reverence. So Jesus, in this garden here, he's saying, I'm troubled even unto death. He's crying out loudly. Have you heard somebody crying loudly? He had tears coming down. He's crying loudly with this terror that was before him, this betrayal that was before him, this experience of having the guilt and shame of sin that he has never experienced. He knew that was going to lay on him. And so he's crying out loud and, and, and weeping to his father. And uh, it says in this, in this verse here, it's interesting, uh, and he was heard because of his reverence. This sermon with this prayer that Jesus prayed, in a sense, it's kind of a, a lesson on God not answering our prayers because Jesus said, please let this pass from me. And we all know that it did not. He experienced it. But it's, it's, also, an ex it's also kind of a lesson on God answering our prayers because Jesus said, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want, God. And so it's like God said no to the first part. No, I'm not going to take this away from you. But he said yes to the second part, or Jesus prayed, but whatever you want. He said, okay. God said, all right, I will do what I want. I will do this thing because it's better. And so that's kind of what we experience when we pray, when God tells us no. And uh, if we pray like Jesus and we pray, not my will, but your will be done, we, we know that that prayer will get answered every time. God will do what he wants to be done. But we see here Jesus praying, and he's in anguish, and he asks his, his three friends to remain here and watch. And then he went a little further to pray. And going a little further, he fell on the ground. All right, so this, he's weeping loudly. He's crying out. He falls down to the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He prayed, if it's possible, may this this hour passed from me, this one he did not want to face. And I don't want us to overlook how heavy this was on Jesus. He really did want this hour to pass from him. It wasn't a fake request. He was so burdened and terrorized by the events that were going to take place. He couldn't stand it. He wanted it to be removed from him. Uh, turn again to Hebrews chapter 12, please. This is an important verse to remember and look at. I think of it often, and it encourages me. Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 2 and 3, we're told to look to Jesus. It says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So he looked at the joy on the other side of the cross, and he was able to endure it. But looking ahead to that joy that laid ahead, for it didn't take away the terror. It didn't take away the feelings of betrayal. It just enabled him to, to step into it. But it was 
It was a terrible experience. It didn't erase the dread that he was facing, but it empowered him to go into it and to, to drink this dread that was being poured out on him. And so he's praying to the Lord, if it were possible that this might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Remember when we read this phrase in, in uh, Galatians. This is the Aramaic term. The language that, that Jesus spoke was Aramaic. And the Bible is written in Greek. And they, they probably read Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew Bible in their synagogue, but they spoke in Aramaic. And Abba is the Aramaic term for daddy. It's an, the intimate, childlike term. And Jesus prays, Abba, Father, even though he knew all those things that we talked about, what God was going to pour out on him. He, he didn't lose his intimacy with God, even though he knew God was allowing something terrible to happen. He embraced this intimacy with God. And Paul encourages us to do the same things. He quotes this twice in Romans 8, 15 and in Galatians 4, 6, where he says, we too can pray, Abba, Father. And Paul isn't talking about us praying in Aramaic. He's talking about the intimacy that that signifies. That Jesus was facing the greatest trial of his life, and he cried out, Abba, Father. And he professed, all things are possible for you. He knows all things are possible from God. And then he makes the request, remove this cup from me. Remove this cup from me. He wants it to, to, to he doesn't want to have to face it. But yet, the very next sentence, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is an amazing prayer. And it's a prayer we need to learn to pray. If Jesus prayed it at this tr time of his life, we need to be praying this as well. Uh, we, we recited the Lord's Prayer. We prayed the Lord's Prayer. And in it we say, uh, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we really pray, your, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's going to have to mean this takes place, where we say, not what I will, but what you will. It has to happen. If his will is going to happen down here on earth, we've got to give up what we want. We have to give up our will and say, God, what you will. But the question is, can we trust him? Can we trust God to that what he wants is better than what we want? Can we trust God to say, not what I want, because you, God, you can see around the corner. You see that thing that I don't see. Can we trust God enough to say, not what I will, but what you will? When it comes to something really, really important. Uh, Jesus was, the tears were flowing down his cheeks. He was crying out loud, verbally, he was loud. He was falling down on the ground. Imagine that scene. What if you came to somebody in that posture, crying out, lying on the ground, no regard for how he looked, Right? He was so in such anguish, but he was still able to say, but not what I want, even though I want it this bad, but what you want. This is a difficult thing to pray, and it requires a lot of faith. I think something that can help us intellectually uh, to understand this and, and to be able to get there is, is turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, please. 1 Corinthians 13, or listen as I read. First Corinthians 13 and verse 12. This is the love chapter. But in it, there's just this little piece of information that has made less sense to me in the past. But then as I started studying this prayer, it made more sense to me. And Paul is, talk, uh, Paul is just talking about uh, the, the age to come. And he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then in the age to come face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And I, I, that always just kind of, I was like, I don't quite understand why he's saying even as I am fully known, or even as I have been fully known. 
but it it ties into this idea of praying uh, yet not what I will but what you will God is God fully knows us and we make our decisions based on our knowledge of ourselves right but we don't really even fully know ourselves he says in the age to come I will know fully even as I am fully known but right now we don't even fully know ourselves we think we want one thing and then we find out in time actually I didn't want that after all I didn't know I didn't want that I thought I did want that and uh, sometimes we just have to experience getting the thing we thought we wanted to learn we didn't want it um, so to think of this idea, I am fully known, but not by me. God fully knows me, and he really understands what is for my good and what will lead to joy, eternal joy and uh, happiness. And he wouldn't be a good God if he always gave us the things we wanted, even if it made us unhappy, right? Right? We wouldn't be good parents if our kids wanted things that would make them sad or hurt them. And we say, well, I, I love you so much, I'm going to give it to you anyway. We are, we, we are seen as good parents by not giving them the thing that will hurt them, even though they don't understand it. And I think if we grasp this idea that we are fully known by God, and even though we are adults, we are like small children in comparison to God. And he can see around the corner. He knows what things that we don't know and but it requires faith to trust him all right he's going to answer my prayers according to what is for the the ultimate good and for my ultimate good and i do believe that someday when we arrive in the age to come we're not no one is going to look back and say ah i still think you should have answered my prayer that way at that time we're all going to say okay now i get it now i see it really was worth it that was a better idea so i think that can help us intellectually but it's still hard to do and uh, i i think that i do get this intellectually but it's i don't get it in my heart all the time turn to another passage in acts chapter 21 this is always intrigued me one day when i read it and, and it sunk in it's such an interesting passage acts chapter 21 uh, and starting in verse 10, and the, Paul is heading to Jerusalem, and uh, he's, he's on a ship heading to Jerusalem, and in verse 10 it says, while, we're, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. In ver, uh, Acts 21, verse 11, And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles. All right, so they're on their way to Jerusalem. A prophet shows up and gives a, an illustration showing, he says, this is what the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit says the owner of this belt, Paul, he's going to get tied up and handed over to his enemies. In verse 12, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. All right, so this is Luke writing and speaking to us. He said, Luke, his friend, we all urged him. We heard the prophecy. Uh, this is what's going to happen. And so we urged him not to go. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. I just think that's so interesting of a statement they made. They're begging him, don't go, don't go. Look, you're warned. The Holy Spirit warned you, don't go. And Paul says, nothing can stop me. I'm willing to even die. I'm going to go. And just this, this idea, all right, fine, fine, fine. We'll let the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> it's, it's kind of it's like we can't stop the thing from happening that we want, so okay, we'll let God's will be done. <laughs> and uh, so these people were not like Jesus in the sense that Jesus didn't need pushed. He just said, Lord, your will be done. But they, they, couldn't, they couldn't execute their will despite their best efforts, so finally they conceded, all right, Lord, you can do what you want to do. And it's just such, it, it reveals the emotional problem we have with praying this prayer. But I think if Jesus can do it and did do it, 
we should do it as well. And uh, so Jesus prays, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may, ent that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we can compare uh, the disciples' ability to pray to Jesus' ability to pray. Uh, they didn't know what was coming, but they couldn't, they, they couldn't even keep awake. Uh, their spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. Now, Jesus wasn't some Hercules, right? He fasted regularly. Uh, one of the Psalms says you could see all of his bones in a prophecy of Jesus at his crucifixion. Uh, though he was not a particularly, there's nothing to indicate that he was a particularly strong man, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of self-control. And even though he did have a regular human uh, flesh and blood, it didn't make him unable to do what his spirit was willing to do. And so he comes out and he sees this discouraging thing. He's there pouring his heart out to God. And he says, well, I've got my friends praying for me. And he goes back and they're sleeping. Oh, I forgot to pray for you, Jesus. And what does he do? And again, he went away and he prayed saying the same words. All right, so we might come to a place in our life where we work through it and we say, please, no, God, I don't want this to happen. And then finally we get to the place where we can say, all right, God, not my will, but your will be done. And then we go back to saying, no, please, I don't want this to happen. Jesus went back and he prayed the same words. Just because you're able to, to make that step in faith and pray that doesn't mean you're going to feel like you want to retract it and say, I changed my mind, not your will. Please don't let this happen. You might have to go through it several times. It seems like Jesus did. And again, he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. They were speechless. They were, I'm surely embarrassed, but didn't know what to say. Jesus saw this discouraging scene twice. His closest friends not offering a prayer for him. Uh, but he had prayed, and he, he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I think this is, this is a good verse to read as we think of this prayer that Jesus prayed, then he was able to stand up and say, all right, let's go. Let's do it. I've prayed. I've poured my heart out before God. He sincerely meant not what I want, Father, but what you want. And that empowered him to stand up and say, all right, let's go. Here's my betrayer. Here he is. He was able to accept the betrayal because he was strengthened in prayer not because God answered his prayer, but because God heard his prayer. And he knew, all right, God, is, God can do all things. God is good all the time. He heard me. He can do whatever he wants. I'm ready to face this trial and this test. And for each one of us, God's grace will be sufficient for us at the worst moment in our lives. It's a scary thing to think. There is something happening. At, there is something lying ahead. There is the worst moment of my life is going to come. But God's grace will be sufficient at that time. It might not feel sufficient now, but it doesn't have to be sufficient now. It will be sufficient at the moment. It will be enough. God's grace will be enough. So we need to listen to Jesus here, what he said to his disciples. We need to watch and pray. He told his disciples to watch and pray, and they didn't do it. They didn't fare so well uh, through the trial, did they? They all ran away, and uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. But we must watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation. And pray like Jesus did. Uh, I've preached sermons about God answering prayer and his ability to answer prayer. This sermon's a little different, and it's important to hear but we need to pray this way so that we do not fall into temptation. 
Let's go ahead and stand together, and we're going to sing a hymn. The hymn is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. So we'll stand together, and we'll sing this hymn. Uh, we can connect it to this text. Jesus said, all right, stand up. Let's go. And that might mean not getting what we want, but we're going to stand up for Jesus. We're going to face whatever trials and temptations face us, but we're going to do it watching and praying. Let's sing together. Let's go be watchful and be prayerful this week. <laughs> 